We're at the Miami Beach Holocaust Memorial. Can you tell us a little bit about it? I know there's a, like my family, for example, my, my grandmother is a Holocaust survivor. And she, you know, as much as I try to get her to, to talk about it, she obviously is uncomfortable about it. So if there's any information that you can provide that can help all our viewers and help the world know what occurred, I mean, it, it's, it's a travesty. And a lot of people don't talk about it. And I was just talking to my mom earlier and I was saying how, how sad it is because in my opinion, if my grandma was 13 when she went through it, that means the youngest person now would be about 76 or so. So we're looking about 14 more years and we might lose everybody or 30 years. You know, what happens in 40 years when there's no more survivors, nobody to talk about it. So if you can just go in a little bit about it, I would appreciate it. Well, that definitely is a reality and it's uh, sooner than later. Uh, many of the survivors have passed. Uh, they're in their late 90s. Uh, and this is a memorial to show you what can happen. There are also names, of, if you walk through and you go through, you'll see later on, uh, names of family members that were put up by their surviving family uh, that had passed because they had no place to be memorialized. In, in Poland, you think Poland is like probably the largest graveyard in the world. Every field has got to have blood of all people. But the Jews were systematically targeted for extinction. But the Nazis killed the gays, they killed the blacks, the Romas, the infirmed, anybody that wasn't the perfect specimen, which was their end goal. So this here is a memorial. You see it's artwork meant to tell a story. And the title of the artwork is Love and Anguish. And it was created by an architect by the name of Kenneth Treaster. And it tells a story, you know, there, there, you see so many different things, and it's art, so you see it differently, maybe, than I do. Uh, the atmosphere of the city of Miami Beach, when they built it in the late 80s, early 90s, finished, uh, didn't want it. It was sun and the fun in Miami Beach, but we had one of the largest population of Holocaust survivors in the country. And, and it was a it was a need. It's necessity because the message carries to today not only the memories of the people, but the memories of what can happen when we see something, say nothing, and not be. I, I think Ali Wiesel had a quote that I love. Like, what's the opposite of love? So if I asked you what opposite of love, what would your answer be? Hey. And that's probably the most common answer, but his answer was indifference. And that's what it was all about, you know, hey, it doesn't matter, it's not me, they, they mean nothing. And we're people, we're, you know, we're, today what we're doing is what these people were doing and then the next day they had no rights. Right. They were no different than the rest of us. Uh, the other thing that's interesting about our property the true address here is 1933 to 1945 Meridian Avenue. And those numbers are really interesting because 1933 was really the rise of Adolf Hitler and the Nazi party in 1945, the ending dates of the, of the war. So when you look out here, and you'll be able to walk through, when you see that arm, what do you think it's saying? It's Honestly, you had, you had asked me earlier, and you know, the first thing that came to my mind is safety. They're trying to get to safety because the stories that I, you know, as a kid, the only stories that I remember are the gas chambers of them, you know, loading them up into those, into the trains or sending them into the so called showers. And so when I see that, I just see people desperate to get to safety like, just desperate. And I think that that's, for sure, it's your perception, so it's right. And it's an arm, we can see it's reaching up. Maybe it's reaching to the heavens for help, to the gods for help, whomever. You see they're helping each other, the, the pain in their face, but they're still reaching down to help the next one. The other thing that I find that's interesting that, you know, the more you sit here, you see it differently each time you come. The tattoo, of, I don't know if you can see a number of just below I the do. Uh, but it never was on the right arm. It was always on the left arm. 
So that's not a mistake that was accidental. My feeling is that, you know, we don't create an image of something that was bad. True. But when you walk forward here, come on up, come up this way here. You know, I don't know, can you get the reflection in the water of yep. the arm? So now it became the left arm. So after I sat here for a while, you know, I volunteer and, you know, you always are searching to find an answer that you like. I looked down and I said, from the depth of darkness, that arm is all the way down in the dark water up into the light because light is symbolic of hope. Very true. And the, the water, why all the water? Well, water is life. Water, the water keeps the memories of those lost alive and you know really it's keeping a message alive what could happen you see you see what could happen yeah and that's because the world watched the world listened and they remained silent so here today all the time unfortunately in our times that we live in see something say something so i i have to ask you i want i want you to say that again because i want everybody to hear that what you just said about as the world watched and listened and remained silent. I want everybody to hear that. Can you say that one more time? I, I sure can. Uh, you know, people have asked me, well, why did it happen? I don't like that because a why is a justifiable answer. And there is no reason. How it happened, you'll see there's a quote on one of the panels that said, while the world watched, because the world saw what was going on. Maybe people died while the world listened and the world remains silent. And it's like, when you do that, it's like you don't care. Right. So maybe that gives power to the people that are doing it. Uh, and at some point, hey, this is real, we gotta do something. But that's, that's the big thing, and the water's keeping that memory alive. Very true. Uh, you know, and I'm gonna let you walk through in a moment, but I'll tell a story, because the, we know the history of the war. And people's stories are different. I think you told me your your grandmother escaped into the underground. Yep. She is a survivor from Germany, right? Yep. We had a survivor here by the name of Herbie Carliner who was on the boat to St. Louis that came from Germany trying to get many people out. Went to Cuba, was turned away. Came to the U.S. here, right off our coast here, Miami Beach. Turned away and ended up back in Europe. And we know what happened at that point. I share my mother-in-law and father-in-law's story. I like to because how it personally has to do with me as an American born, I'm a Jew and a person, so this has to do with all of us. My parents were American grandparents, but my father-in-law was married to my mother-in-law's sister when my mother-in-law was a seven-year-old child. And by the time the Nazis came in, she was 20. Um, they took the whole family, killed his wife and children, killed the rest of the family. Only um, he and two sisters survived. Wow. So what he had done after he came out and was able to find her, in the Jewish tradition, the man took care of the family. He came back and married his sister-in-law, the youngest of them, to take care of her family. So I think back now. If that experience didn't happen, he wouldn't have married my mother-in-law. If he didn't marry my mother-in-law, they would not have given birth to my wife, who would not be my wife. I might be married to be someone else, and my children would be someone else. Absolutely. So, you know, their experience had a, a direct impact on my life. And, and you know, everybody there has had a, had a direct impact, believe it or not. Like, even my grandma had, had she had gotten caught. You know, it, I probably would not be here today. Exactly. So. You know, so it's up to us, the fact that you're documenting things like this, the fact that I think you brought, was it your daughter that was with My niece. niece. You know, you bring the children to talk about it because, as you said in the very beginning, there's not going to be survivors left in, in several years. Right. So it's up to us to share the message. The message Absolutely. of what can happen. And hopefully with that information, we can make 
our area, our homes, a little bit better. Absolutely. Maybe a little bit at a time, but anything that we could do to prevent things like this from happening to anyone. That's true. If you don't learn from history, you're bound to, you're doomed to repeat it. Right. And, and that's the truth. We are who we are today because of what we've learned. Hopefully we would be the person we think we would be. Right. But you never know who you, but, but we have knowledge. Absolutely. And it's what you do with that knowledge that makes a difference for the future. Very true. All right. Well, Michael, I appreciate you taking time to speak with us. We're going to go ahead and take a walk through. And uh, again, thank you so much. Thank you. So I know the video is a little shaky, guys, and I apologize, but believe it or not, while I myself am not Jewish because I was adopted, this means a lot to me because I love my grandma more than anything. And to think about what she had to go through just to make it here today. I wish I could go slower and record everything, but it is extremely hot here in Miami. And my phone will not last. It's already given me the overheat warning. You can see the reflection in the water. Sorry about the reflection off the wall, guys. Between that photo and this photo. And then this is the one that really just pisses me off. They marked them gift gas. And I'm not talking much about it guys because I honestly, I don't know much about it. And uh, my grandma's not one to really talk about it for, you know, for her own personal reasons.
mean, these statues are just devastating. If you seriously take the time to think about what these people went through, the agony. Can you imagine being ripped away from your parents? Knowing what's coming? Forced to hide in tunnels? I'm gonna point this out. There's a lot of open space on this wall. If you or a loved one know anybody who was a Holocaust survivor or had family or friends that were Holocaust survivors, I encourage you to reach out to the memorial here in Miami, Florida and get their names put on that wall. They deserve it. That's the least we could do is get their names up on that wall. These are just the names of those that they know because family and friends have reached out.
All right. So in closing, there's going to be two things. I'm going to read this to you. Ideals, dreams, and cherished hopes rise within us only to meet the horrible truth and be shattered. And Frank. And the last thing I'll leave you guys with, again, if you or your family know anybody, if your family is a survivor, if anybody in your family is a survivor, if you have a friend that is a survivor, if you have a family friend that's a survivor, anybody, I encourage you, if their names aren't already on this wall here at this memorial in Miami, I encourage you to encourage them to reach out, get their names, get their loved ones' names up on this wall. It's the least we can do the very least we could do to pay tribute to them all right guys thanks for watching and uh love you all